just event series facilitated by the International Peace Foundation. We have today a very, very special guest for us. Professor Edward Moser, who is a Nobel Prize laureate for medicine in 2014, uh, has discovered the grid cell himself, mm -hmm. is going to talk to us in a topic of the brain GPS, how do we know where we are. To start our program, may I call upon the pro uh, Professor Dr. Bandit Uyarapon, the president of Jalalongkorn University, to present his welcome remarks. Professor Bandit, could you please give us the honor? Thank you. Your Excellency, the Ambassador to Thailand, Professor Hedval Inkal Mosa, the Nobel Laureate for Medicine in 2014, Mr. Uwe Murovets, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, distinguished colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to warmly welcome to attend the prestige initiated by Mr. Uwe Morovets as an independent contribution to the United Nations decade for a culture of peace and nonviolence that took place from 2003 to 2004. After the resounding success of that series that brought together several Nobel laureates as well as other keynote speakers and artists who all reached out to a vast audience of over 200,000 across the Southeast Asian region. Bridges has now returned to Thailand and later this year to Japan with a renewed aim of bringing together the best and brightest minds of the world from November 2023 to March 2024. Nobel laureates in physics, economics and medicine this erroneous gathering will certainly inspire and stimulate academic exchange and enhance further development in several key areas through programs in education. Today, we have gathered here at the Faculty of Medicine and King Chulalongkorn Memorial Hospital to warmly welcome a highly esteemed academic and renowned scholar of global reach, influence, and inspiration. Professor Edward Ingal Mosa. He is the most distinguished and exemplary Nobel laureate for medicine, recognized for his rigorous research over the years, which has made him one of the most outstanding neuroscientists of his generation. Professor Mosa brings with him a prodigious wealth of knowledge and expertise best known for discovering grid cells in the brain's entorhinal cortex and their pivotal role in gathering and generating spatial coordinations to support spatial navigation. His more recent groundbreaking research expands beyond spatial navigation, delving into its integration with other cell types to support the brain representation of what, where, and when. We are immensely honored to have him speak to us today on the topic, the brain's GPS, how we know where we are, where he explores the brain system for space and time. We are looking forward to having him walk us through the neural processes involved in memory and thinking where we are told, 
could even lead to crucial advances in the early detection and treatment of Alzheimer's disease. The implications of his research area are understandably far-reaching and tremendous, especially for so many countries in the world, Thailand included, facing the, press issue, the pressing issue of maintaining a quality of life for the elderly in a rapidly aging society. We wish to express our appreciation to Professor Moser for traveling to Thailand to share with us his wills and expertise gained from decades of scholarship, research, and extensive academic pursuits. May I also take this opportunity to convey our deep thanks to our esteemed business sponsors, BMW Thailand, Dusitani Hotel and Resorts, Kasikon Bank, and Mitsui Futosang Company Limited. They have lent their kind support in making this event possible and truly successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bandit. Next off, I would like to in, uh, invite Mr. Uwe Murowitz, the chairman of International Peace Foundation, without whom this event cannot happen, to, uh, to uh, deliver his opening remarks. Mr. Uwe, could you please give us the honor? So welcome to the Japan ASEAN Bridges event series, which is facilitated by the Vienna-based International Peace Foundation. The events are hosted in cooperation with various uh, local partners, including some of the country's main universities. And I would like to thank Chulalongkorn University for hosting our event today commemorating the 50th anniversary of official relations between Japan and the ASEAN region. Bridges uh, is continuously held in Thailand and Japan until March this year, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics. The Japan ASEAN Bridges series follows the series of over 800 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has facilitated since 2003 to support education in the ASEAN region. Bridges has been established as an international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary platform for creative cultures of learning and continued education for all people. The foundation has no concept for peace and no fixed solutions how to achieve peace, but we believe that the first step towards peace is dialogue and the first step towards dialogue is respect. The International Peace Foundation doesn't take sides, but acts as a mediator by creating an independent platform for dialogue where people meet who normally don't meet. People from all walks of life. People who speak different languages, even if they speak the same. As politicians speak another language than artists, and business and religious leaders, another one than scientists, it is seldom that they speak with each other or even work together. We live in a world where some people pretend to know the answers and solutions, how to solve problems, how to achieve peace. Though the quest for peace lies in the art to pose the right questions. The International Peace Foundation believes that the interconnected problems of our world today cannot be solved only by politicians, only by business, only by scientists, or by, by religion alone, but by working together. In the Bridges event series, people from all walks of life meet in a multidisciplinary program to find creative solutions to solve problems and to achieve peace. Peace within ourselves, peace within our families, within our social structures, peace, peace with nature and the environment, peace between nations, cultures, and religions. Peace is a process. Dialogue is a process. It is nothing which can be achieved instantly. It needs time. 
This is why Bridges is not organized as a single conference but as a series of events of now over two decades in which Nobel laureates have built bridges with leaders in all parts of society and with the general public. Peace is not something which can be left to the elite of a few but which needs the participation of everyone. Only if many ways cross and people walking these ways meet can international understanding be achieved and problems commonly solved. If we listen to and learn from each other, we may discover that there is not only one way to achieve peace, but that there are many ways and certainly ways we have never thought of to go. So it is my pleasure to invite you today to listen to and to share your views with Professor Edward Moser, the Nobel Laureate for Medicine, who has agreed to come to Thailand to help build bridges. We all look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribu contribution towards peace. A warm welcome, Professor Moser. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Uwe. May I uh, invite uh, Mr. Uwe, Professor Shanchai, Professor Moser, and Professor Bandit to take a quick group photo before we start our keynote speech today? As Thank you very much. Uh, and that marks the opening ceremony of our Bridges event today. And as you can see that we, in Asian, country, Asian culture, we take photographing very seriously. Well, my name is uh, Associate Professor Parit Mekrun Kamal. I would like to, I'm honored to be a master of ceremony for today's event. And um, as, uh, uh, Professor, uh, as Professor Bandit and Mr. Uwe has mentioned before, this is the time we've all been waiting for. Uh, the, very special keynote speech delivered by uh, Professor Edward Moser in a topic of the brain GPS, how we know where we are. Professor Moser, if you can please give us the honor. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the invitation and especially thank you to Kula Longkorn University and the Faculty of Medicine for hosting this event and uh, also to the International Peace Foundation for organizing this series uh, of Bridges talks. So uh, um, while my talk will uh, primarily address uh, how the brain works, uh, I also appreciate this opportunity to be uh, part of something bigger where uh, I think uh, the important point is to recognize that education and science have an important uh, role to play in creating peace. There's nothing more important maybe uh, in our efforts to try to maintain and create peace than educating the, the population and through education you need science because that's how we advance uh, knowledge. So thanks you so much for doing this over all these years and thanks again to the university for hosting the event and being part of it. So the topic for my uh, talk as you heard is uh, the brain's navigation system or uh, sometimes we call it the brain's GPS. They are the, uh, I'm going to talk about the brain's systems for knowing where we are and how we get from one place to the other. Um, so let us step back a little bit first and I want you to, to present 
to you one of um, what I consider one of the real breakthroughs that is happening in all sciences now, namely um, the breaking of uh, the barrier that has traditionally been between the fields of psychology on one hand and physiology on the other hand. That means how on one hand you have our thoughts, our feelings, our knowledge and so on, our memories, um, which we all experience, they're part of our daily life experience. But then on the other hand, we have all the things that take place in our brains. What's the link between those two? How are thoughts and feelings and ideas and memories created by the activity of neurons in the brain? That's a really, really difficult question. And the challenge uh, is uh, just illustrated by the fact that uh, there are almost 100 billion neurons in the brain and each of those billion, 100 billion neurons have about 10,000 connections on average to other uh, neurons, other brain cells and uh, it is in those connections that much most of the information in the brain um, lies. So um, it is very small, very distributed and huge numbers how can we access all this information? And um, I can just illustrate that with a movie here. So it's a cartoon of what it might look like in the brain. Here you have the neurons or the brain cells. Um, they communicate with electrical signals, which you here see in white. Uh, so the electrical discharges, they spread and cross from one neuron to the other, like you see here. Now to the left is one brain cell. It releases some chemicals that jumps over to the next cell. And when they come over to the next cell, that in turn generates electrical activity again. That goes through those cells and then may result in new chemicals being released um, uh, in the communication with other cells. And then this happens then in about 10 to the 15th of synapses or uh, connections between cells in the brain. So, how can we approach the link between physiology and psychology? There was uh, a lot of progress uh, starting in around the 1950s. So that was a time when this is after the Second World War and uh, optimism again started to grow um, and uh, illustrated with these pictures from the 1950s. And here at the bottom you see uh, uh, a picture of uh, two of uh, the grandfathers of uh, modern systems neuroscience. So it's uh, David Jubel and Torsten Wiesel. So Torsten Wiesel uh, is still uh, around. He, he turns 100 uh, this year. And um, there's going to be a big celebration for him in New York uh, later this year. So what they discovered uh, is uh, uh, they did um, recorded activity from brain cells in what we call the visual cortex. So visual cortex is the brain area, uh, the part of the cortex. So cortex is the surface of most of the brain, which uh, does most of the intellectual activity. Um, so the visual cortex deals with uh, inputs from the eyes and interprets the visual images that come into the brain. So this is, makes it possible to see and perceive the world uh, in visual images. So they recorded from brain cells there and found that when they presented bars, so this is a line or a bar, in different orientations, then those cells responded more to some orientations than to the others. And different cells then responded to different orientations. And what they did was to discover some of the building blocks for the visual system, for how the brain interprets images that come from our eyes. And this was part of a bigger effort where neuroscientists in the 1950s and 60s started to understand how signals that came from the outside, from our senses into the brain, how they were interpreted by the brain and how they were converted to signals, to electrical signals in the brain. And um, I can illustrate their work with this diagram. This is a diagram of uh, of uh, many brain areas. It has a bottom, it has a top, and each brain area is a box here, and then the lines are how they are connected. So the visual images from the eyes come in at the bottom here, and then they go through into the cortex, uh, 
which is uh, shown here in uh, purple, pink, purple, down at the bottom here, and V1 is the area where they did the recording. So it's really at the bottom of this brain hier hierarchy. And uh, much of the information learned over the next years was about what happened here at the bottom. But now there's a lot above here which really remained a mystery and still remains a mystery. What go goes on further inside in the brain when you go away from what comes in through the senses? And that brings me to what I'm going to talk about today. Namely, I want to go to the other opposite, to the top of this uh, hierarchy in the brain. Well, here, um, in, at least in one conceptualization of the brain, you have an area here at the top that is called uh, hippocampus, and below it you have another area called entorhinal cortex. So I'll come back to those brain areas. But the point I want to make now is that um, we are now taking the opposite approach and simply try to ask what are the neural or the brain mechanisms that underlie the most advanced functions that are far away from the sensory inputs, at the real, really in the middle of the brain. And uh, in that respect, uh, the work I'm going to focus on today is about the brain's mechanisms for perceiving space and time. I'm not going to talk much about time, but you can ask me about that in the break if you want, or in the questions section. But I will focus on space, because that's where we know most, on, and also the, the easiest to uh, discuss. And why am I interested in space? Well, space is, uh, that is, um, that is uh, um, a property of the brain that uh, you cannot directly refer that back to any sensory inputs. So when I know that I'm here and not out there, that is uh, a knowledge I have, which is not just the sum of my, uh, the inputs that go in through my eyes or my ears or my uh, touch sensors or to my nose. It is more than that. It's something that the brain knows that it generates uh, by doing more than just summing up the sensory inputs. So it's actually knowledge that we have in the brain before we get any sensory inputs, and uh, that I will come back to later in the talk. But I want to use this uh, in opportunity here in the introduction to highlight the work of Immanuel Kant, uh, a philosopher whose work was taking place at uh, the second half of the 1700s. So many of you may be familiar with his work through studies of uh, philosophy. But uh, one of the things that he um, claimed was that there are some capacities of the brain, like space, time is another one, causality the third one, um, that uh, we are just born with it and we can't escape uh, perceiving the world through those. I mean, we can't imagine or interpret our experience unless we put it through space, time and so on. It's just the, the principles that everything we know is organized around. So that's an interesting approach uh, to understanding the brain because this is something that is given, that is there and is independent of those sensory inputs. So in a way we take the opposite approach of what uh, Jubel and Wiesel, for example, did in their early sensory studies. And what's attractive about space is, is not just that it is sort of conceptually interesting because it's really a building on the inside of the brain, but it's also that it's very convenient because it's easy to measure and it's easy to do so in animals, in rodents. So rats and mice, for example, are very good at finding their way. They know where they are and they know how to get from one place to the other, They're actually as good as sometimes even better than we are. So uh, if we want to understand how our brain does it, we can actually learn very much from a mouse brain or a rat brain. They do it just as well and they do it very much in the same way. So that uh, it's much easier to obtain that information than if we had to do everything on humans uh, directly. And for that reason, we actually also know a lot about the space system in rodents. So we have uh, knowledge that we already can build upon. So um, then where in the brain should we search? 
So, um, there of course, space is something that many brain areas are involved in, in that, but there are still some areas that may be more important than others, and I highlight two of them here. So, what you see is a picture of a human brain, and then you see two highlighted areas, one in red and one in blue. The one in red is called hippocampus, seahorse, and the other one is called entorhinal cortex, which is highly connected to the hippocampus. So both of them are in what we call the medial temporal lobe. So temporal lobe is on the sides, behind your ears in a way, and it's actually where the cortex, so cortex is the top of the brain, uh, as I said, which is responsible for uh, much of our intellectual activity, so which has grown very much in uh, primates and in humans compared to other species. But the, uh, in the medial temporal lobe, this cortex turns around, goes on the bottom and goes on the inside. And on that inside part, you have the hippocampus, and it is also connected to the entorhinal cortex. So it's deep in the brain on the inside. So we know these are important because humans who have damage in these brain areas usually have two sorts of problems. They can't find their way, and they, have, uh, they forget. So, um, but uh, still, if you want to understand what's going on in these brain areas, we need to do more than just studying what happens when you lose them. So, what's going on in the brain cells or in the neurons in those brain areas? And then we can learn a lot from much simpler systems. So, we have again the human brain here with its almost 100 billion neurons to the right. 86 uh, billion is one estimate. And you go then towards the left, you come to the, through monkeys, you come to rat brain, which has about 200 million neurons only, and then uh, mouse brain, only 70 millions, and you can go all the way down, and if you really want to study a simple organism, you can, uh, there is a nematode, a small worm that has only 302 neurons, it's the size of a comma, and even that is very complicated. So, uh, the idea is that whenever it's possible in order to understand something that's going on in the human brain, we try to push it to as simple systems as possible, not always down to uh, the nematode C elegance, because sometimes we believe we can do more than, uh, than the nematode, uh, although sometimes you may doubt. But uh, uh, usually we end up somewhere in the middle, and uh, for navigation or for understanding space, rats and mice are actually quite good species because they are very good at it, and they have developed a space system that is quite similar to ours. So that is because of evolution then, that we have all evolved from a common ancestor, and in this case it's uh, a common ancestor for mammals. So, um, because of this evolution, the cortex, for example, in the brains of different species of mammals are organized very much in the same way. So you have uh, in humans to the right, and then you have other primates, and you have rodents, and so on. You can see that the cells in the brain are organized in similar layers. It's more differentiated, more complicated in humans, but the basic organization is the same for a long uh, way from humans to right towards uh, uh, smaller species uh, towards the left. And it's not only the organization of the brain that is similar, but it's also the way it communicates. So I mentioned in the video I showed in the start that the brain cells or neurons communicate with electrical signals. And uh, those electrical signals, which you often call discharges, or we call them action potentials, these are currents that reflect currents that go into the cell and go out of the cell. Very briefly, it produces an electric pulse that then may be distributed through the neuron and allow communication to other neurons. And this was discovered already, uh, especially with the work of Hodgkin and Huxley in the early 1950s, where they found out the basic mechanisms of the action potential. And they did their work on uh, on uh, squid neurons, neurons from squids, because those neurons are so big and fairly easy to study. And again, the basics of neural communication is the same in every animal, so that uh, you can learn a lot from going away from human species, and it is still retained as you get to primates and, and humans. 
So electrical communication is central and that's the basis for everything else that I'm going to present to you today. So let us then get towards uh, the mechanisms for space and our internal maps of space. And that brings me to the work of John O'Keefe at the University College of London, uh, one of my former mentors. Um, in 1971, he uh, discovered uh, a new type of cell in the brain. And this is the work that for which he got the uh, uh, Nobel Prize in 2014, which then was shared between him and Margaret Moser and me for the work on spatial um, mapping in the brain. And his work was based on neural recordings from rats in uh, a spatial environment. You see a rat here, and uh, it is for the occasion connected through a cable that uh, goes to an oscilloscope or now, nowadays to a computer that records the signals and the connection is, goes into very, very small sensors that stick into the brain called electrodes which then pick up the electrical activity from the neurons and because they are so small they can actually squeeze in between the neurons and then pick up the electrical signals from the neurons around without damaging them. And uh, in this way, those electrical signals from those neurons that you saw in the first video, they can actually be transferred to the computer and be recorded. And you have a record of what those neurons are doing at the same time as this rat is doing a task. For example, running around in a box or walking around in a maze to find some food rewards here and there. So you can do this when the rat is doing natural behaviors, because the interference is so small, uh, you just have to plug this cable in here, but otherwise the rat can behave freely uh, and, and do whatever it wants. So I'll illustrate one such experiment um, with a video. And uh, you, what you now will see in the video that comes up very soon is an overhead image, so a camera at the ceiling of the room taking a movie of the rat is running around in a box. You see the box there. The box is the size of one by one meter. And in that box, there are small chocolate treats all around. Just small crumbles of chocolate have been thrown out uh, in, in a random pattern. And that's enough to keep the rat running around, visiting every possible place. And then at the same time as the rat is doing that, we are going to listen to the electrical activity of one single cell in this brain area called the hippocampus, the red area, which is now shown for a rat instead of a human, but it's the same as you saw in the human uh, before. So one single cell, and each time you hear a signal, a pop, then this cell is actually shooting an action potential. So let's now see if the sound works here. Yep. This is the activity of that cell. And, you can, and each time the cell is active, you also see a red dot appearing on the image. And now the rat is just running around picking chocolate pieces. Again, you hear it's active, but it's only active when it's in the upper left part. Otherwise, the cell is silent, and it comes back, and so on. So already what you can see here is that this particular cell, brain cell, neuron, is active only when this rat is in the upper left part of the box. So it's active. The activity area is often called a field of activity, and O'Keefe called this a place field, and they call this type of cell a place cell, a cell that signals the place, a certain place in the environment. And you see then a picture of O'Keefe down here, together with uh, uh, his colleague Lynn Nedell, and uh, this is just a color image of the activity of the cell. So uh, warm colors, red is high activity and blue is low activity. And you can see that this particular cell was active in the upper left part of the box. Other neurons, which they also could record, were active in other places in the box so that they each had their preferred area of activity. And then you can imagine if there are many thousands of neurons of this kind in this area of the brain, in the hippocampus, and together uh, the combined activity, which neurons are active at any given time, that actually illustrates, is a reflection of where the rat is at that time. 
So it's an internal map of space, and for that reason, O'Keefe and Nadel then suggested that this was part of the brain's internal map of location. And hippocampus, as you remember from the diagram in the beginning, is at the real inside of the brain. It's far away from any of the senses. So how come the cells in this brain area can be so selective that they're active only when the rat is at some places and not at other places? It, because there are no space sensors in our body, there are no space receptors on my hands or in my eyes or in my ears. So how is this generated? That remained a mystery for many, many years. And then time passed, 10 years about, then in 1984, um, Jim Rank to the left here, and together with his student Jeff Taube, discovered another type of cell, in, not in the hippocampus, but nearby, in another area called the uh, dorsal presubiculum. And this area, uh, at that time, nothing was known about that brain area, and they didn't even try to reach that brain area because this was just an accident. They uh, had some of these sensors or electrodes actually were, were, was meant for the hippocampus, but then they didn't hit and it went astray and they had some other area. And then suddenly, Rank discovered that there were these cells that are only active when the rat is turning in a certain direction. Um, for example, it could be east or west or north, but the different cells had different directions. Uh, it's not in, uh, relative to the magnetic north pole, it's just random in relation to the surrounding room. So in my case, it would be some, if I turn my head that way, some cells would be active, turn my head that way, some other cells would be active. So it's a directions kind of cell in, in the brain, not in the hippocampus together with the place cells, but slightly outside. So, um, but then these two probably are related because they are part of an internal map for used probably for orientation. But that was a status into the mid-1990s. And then more years passed. Uh, and then 2005, then we came into the picture and we recorded from a third brain area here called the medial entorhinal cortex, MEC for short. And that's the blue area here, which uh, lies on the back of the hippocampus, behind the red area. And in that brain area, now you'll see the activity of another rat, again, walking around in a box, doing just the same. It's just picking up chocolate pieces in that box. And you see, for each time the cell is active, you see a white dot appearing. Now you can see that these white dots do not only appear in one single location, but they appear in many locations, in clusters or locations. And those clusters form a very regular pattern that tiles the entire environment. So you can get an illustration of regularity by if you now, if I just put some triangles on top of here, you can see the repeating triangles that cover uh, so uh, cover the environment. So these cells are active, again, like place cells, but they are active at m multiple locations that form a grid that covers the environment. And because they form a grid, a lattice, that over the entire environment, um, it's tempting to suggest that they operate like a, a kind of coordinate system where you can describe locations in X and Y space, and then it repeats for reasons that we can come back to. Um, but um, it is another location signal uh, where different cells have different uh, grids. So this illustrates uh, the activity of one single cell. For another cell, it may be at other locations that may still have the same distance between each other, but they may shift, be shifted to the right or to the left or up or down or whatever. And then yet other cells have different orientations uh, and, or they may have different spacing between each of these clusters. So it's a rich system of these grid cells in the entorhinal cortex. So completely unexpected as well. Although when we started to record in the entorhinal cortex, we knew that this must be some important interface for space because it was located between the hippocampus that has the place cells and the presubiculum which has the direction cells. So there was something uh, that we could sense that this must be an important area, but the fact that these actually have a grid that is, uh, was totally unexpected and opened a completely new uh, uh, research area for us. 
Uh, so I mentioned that uh, there are head direction cells, two direction cells, but it turned out then that the grid cells are intermingled with such cells. So um, again, just cells that have activity in uh, a certain direction. So here, this is a plot of activity in relation to direction. So direction, you have east here, you have west and south and north, and then the, the curve illustrates the activity. So this cell is active only when the rat is heading in the northwest direction. And this is just another recording, and it's stable always again in the northwest direction. They do not have any spatial signals, as you see, they're just, uh, it depends only on direction. And it turned out then that intermingled between the grid cells and the direction cells is yet another type of cell, cells that record or reflect the speed of the animal when it's running around in the environment. So what you see to the left here is in, uh, in a different color for, uh, for uh, uh, seven different cells. So in color you see the activity of one particular cell. And in gray, in the background, you see the speed of the animal at the moment. And you can see how closely those follow each other. So take the yellow cell, for example, that its firing, its activity, its rate of action potentials, is a direct reflection of the speed of the animal. They are almost completely superimposed. And uh, here you see, just see in color the activity of those cells. So red means high activity, blue means low activity. And you can see that they can be active anywhere in this box. It's not, no preference for location. They just reflect the speed as is shown in these diagrams here, where you have speed on the x-axis, and on the y-axis you have uh, the activity of the cells. So you have speed and you have direction. Uh, and then it was tempting, of course, to, to compare this with uh, uh, GPS, because GPSs have in common with the brain uh, that um, they compute your location based on changes in direction and speed. But they don't care about what it looks like where you are. They don't use landmarks like a house or a, a tree or a street. They just compute where you are by adding up changes in location and changes in, in, uh, in the direction. So um, in that sense, uh, the grid cells are thought to do much of the same. They use the speed signals and the direction signals that they get from the neighboring cells and can then compute uh, location dynamically at any given time. But the system turned out also to have lots of other kinds of cells. So here's yet another type of cell. So it turned out that there were also cells that respond only when the animal, the rat, was at uh, the bound, local boundary in the environment. So in this case, it's again a box where the rat runs around and picks up chocolate. Red means high activity for that cell, blue means low activity. And you can see that this cell is active only when the rat is on the right side of the box. And then uh, if you stretch the box, change its uh, shape, and still on the right side. But if you then uh, introduce a wall in the middle of the environment, it starts to be active along that wall as well. So this is a completely different kind of cell that is uh, responds each time the animal is at a local boundary in the environment. And those cells are then accompanied by yet another type of cell, which you illustrate here, which we call, uh, so these we call border cells, but the new type of cell we call object vector cells. And the reason for calling them that is that these cells are active near prominent landmarks or objects, like for example this tower of Lego here in the middle of the box. But then if you move the tower around, then this activity field that is generated by the object, and which is not present when the object is not there, if you then move the object around to the bottom left here, for example, then you also move the uh, activity field. So you can see here, the activity field is on the north side of this object. This is a black uh, circle here. And then you move the black circle to the bottom left here, and the activity field moves with it, meaning that these cells actually reflect activity some distance and direction away from prominent landmarks in the environment. Su suggesting then that there is another kind of system for mapping space in addition to the grid cell system. So the grid cell system is a kind of map 
that is used for the entire space and then the object vector system is uh, uh, not a coordinate system but more like a vector system that calculates position based on distances and direction from certain uh, points in the environment. So then um, in many ways there are two kinds of, of uh, spatial map in the brain. So it began with the place cells that you see here illustrated to the right and what I've done here is to illustrate place cells with four different maps it's just to make the point that uh, in the hippocampus you actually have a map of location that is unique for every possible place where you are. So you may have one map of place cells for this lecture room and then you may have another place cell map for another hall, lecture hall that you have in a different building here. You have one for your own house, you have one for the, your way home and so on. But they are all quite unique and different. You make a new map in every possible environment. And hippocampus actually has the possibility to store all of these different maps. And that's why it's so important for memory in general. In contrast to that, you have the maps in the entorhinal cortex of, that consist of grid cells, object vector cells, and so on. And they turn out just to be one single map that is used over and over again in every possible environment. The only thing you do is that you may rotate it and shift it a little bit, but you use the same map over and over again. And that means that if you have two cells and they have their grids at exactly one location, then the, those two cells, when you get to another place, um, another room, another at home, for example, those two cells will still be together and you get to a third place and they will still be together. So it's one map that is just calibrated differently in the environment, which makes a lot of sense if you want to not overuse the, the brain. So it make, it's smart to make one map that you can use for navigation. It's like having one metric instead of many metrics for every possible environment. And then you use that single metric in every possible place. And instead, in order to make unique maps that are special to every place, then in the hippocampus, when you get to the place cells, then you make them different from each other so that you can have different maps for every possible environment, but based on the metric that is common in the, in the grid cells. And you may wonder, now all of this is shown in uh, rats and mice, but uh, do we also have grid cells? So, the answer is that this is probably common to all mammals, at least. So grid cells have been, were all found in rats and later in mice, uh, which is on a one little branch of the evolutionary tree for mammals. But then they were found in bats, which is a completely different branch, and they still had the same properties. And then in a slightly different uh, way, they were found in monkeys, and they were shown in humans. So uh, in humans, they were shown in patients who suffer from serious epilepsy, and then, then you need to implant similar electrodes into the brain, and then to monitor the activity of a brain area before a decision is made about brain surgery. And then you can pick up those signals as well, and you see that uh, grid cells is something that is, uh, grid cells, place cells, and so on, exist in all mammals, perhaps beyond, we don't know. All right, and then now I talked a lot about uh, the past. So the past was about finding out what do individual cells do in the brain. Um, but we may also wonder what, um, um, how do these cells work together? Because we know that uh, neurons in the brain actually uh, never operate in isolation. They operate as part of huge populations of thousands, many thousands of neurons that work together. So what we need to understand, if we want to understand how we perceive space or time or anything, we need to understand their collaboration in big neural circuits. And this is now becoming possible. So within just a few years, there are new electrical probes that have been completely replacing the ones that were used in the past. So in the past, you just had a single small wire that went into the brain 
and then it was covered by insulation and at the tip you had uninsulated it and at the tip then you could pick up the electrical signals that were uh, nearby. Now you use advanced uh, computer technology, so you use a chip instead. It's very, very thin chips that just are uh, in the orbit of 70 micrometers wide. You see them illustrated here to the right. So this is what it looks like. So all of this is what uh, the bottom here is outside the brain. What goes into the brain is the thin piece uh, at the top here. And that part that goes into the brain is a 70 micrometer wide thing that has lots of spots and each of those spots uh, are electrodes that pick up changes in the electrical uh, activity. So instead of having one channel, now you can have uh, up to 5,000 channels that you can choose from and you can use uh, 384 of them at the same time, which will increase to 1,536 within this year. So you, it means you have so many channels of activity, you can record change now from recording maybe three, four, five neurons at the same time to many thousands at the same time. And that's what I'm illustrating here. So with these new probes, you can record not from one grid cell. So each box here is one grid cell and you see the repeating pattern. So color means uh, high, yellow means high activity, blue means low activity. And you can just see lots of grid cells here. So this is uh, from a recording that uh, consisted of 2,460 cells and 483 of those were grid cells and out of those 149 were from one what we call a module of grid cells. So the grid cells are, are very strongly interconnected. Um, so then you can ask what is the combined, the joint activity of those cells and uh, that can be illustrated with what we call a raster plot. So here you have all the cells. So each row here is the activity of one cell. Black is uh, active, white is not active. And then you have time on the x-axis. And you can then see that at each time point you have different combinations of activity. So let us now focus on one single time point, which for example could be, let's say, 100 milliseconds. And then ask, what is the combined activity of all those cells? And if you now uh, use a subset of 149 cells of grid cells here, uh, in principle, if all of those cells were independent of each other, then uh, the only way you could describe this activity is to plot them in, in uh, a 149 dimensional coordinate system. And it would be quite difficult, at least for the human eye and brain, to track. But um, now you can, actually we are lucky in the sense that those cells are not independent. They are actually highly correlated in many ways. So you can break down the 149 dimensions. There's just a few dimensions that still explain a lot of the variance by using dimensionality reduction approaches. For example, the classical one is principal component analysis and then there are a number of nonlinear uh, approaches that are more common to use now. And then you can get the activity down to, for example, three dimensions. And that's what is shown here. So now, you s this is a point cloud. And in this point cloud, each single dot illustrates the combined activity of 149 cells. So each point is one of these red time slots that you see up in the top uh, diagram here. And now you can see that together those time points form a cloud that has the shape of a torus or a donut. And uh, it's just seen from different angles here. And then the line that you see on top, the red line, is actually corresponds to the five seconds when uh, the rat moved around in the box uh, to the left here. So as the rat moves around, then the activity moves around on this torus uh, that is the combined activity of all these grid cells. So is it a torus? Well, of course, um, then it looks like a torus, but uh, sometimes data are noisy and you can't know. So you have to quantify that. And then suddenly it helps to actually be friends with some mathematicians, because in mathematics there's the field of to mathematical topology, topol topological data analysis, and they have ways to count holes in n dimensions. Uh, and uh, for a torus, what would you expect? Well, you would expect, uh, uh, first of all, you would expect uh, a single component, that is the one number here. You would expect two holes in one dimension, so it's these two orthogonal rings that you see here in red. 
and you would expect one hole in two dimensions which is the inside of the donut kind of so you can calculate this and uh, for this there is a technique called persistent cohomology and uh, I do not have time to explain that techniques but essentially uh, you do a lot of analysis and you get these lines that illustrate the uh, size or the magnitude of those holes. So if you get a long line then it is uh, a big hole. So you get two big holes in dimension one and in this data that from the when the rat is running around in the box and you get one big hole in dimension two. So it's exactly what you would expect for a torus. But now if you do the same when the rat is running in a maze uh, and you don't see so nice grid cells any longer but you still have the two plus one pattern and then if you do it when they are sleeping, they are sleeping now, so they are not running around in the box any longer. So do the grid cells still operate as grid cells when a rat is sleeping? And indeed they do because you still have these uh, two holes in one dimension and one hole in two dimensions. Whether the rat is in dream sleep, REM sleep or whether in the other kind of sleep that's called slow way sleep. So that means these grid cells move around on this torus regardless of whether we are actually moving around in the environment. It's just that when we move around in a real environment, in a physical environment, then this torus is used to map our position as we change around. But the torus can work also even if we don't really have an external map to calibrate it to. And that then raises the question of, um, yeah, this is consistent with uh, some theories. I will not go into that for the interest of time. But it raises the question of whether is this actually something that we learn then or perhaps since it is so ex expressed even during sleep perhaps it's something that uh, we actually have innate that we are born with. So then it's tempting to test whether this actually exists in very young rats. So uh, beginning then in this early work of a postdoc in our lab Matteo Guadamagna who recorded from their brains at postnatal day 15. Uh, this is just at the day when rats start walking around, they leave the nest. So they live for the first two weeks together with their mother in a nest, just like a bird nest. And then they start walking around on approximately day 15. And at that time, they don't have any nice grid cells at all. It's very blurry, uh, as you can see there. But again, you can see the pattern of two long lines in one dimension and one long line in two dimensions. So I skip that. And then we asked, well, if you go even earlier then, on postnatal day 11, then the rats have not opened their eyes yet and they haven't opened the air canals. So they're completely, or at least very strongly, isolated from the world. They can smell, yes, but it's still um, very different. They don't really have any sense of space, at least not through their, uh, the senses that become more important later. They're just... Um, uh, so this is a movie and you can't see it's a movie because the, the rat is just sleeping. They just, they just sleep most of the time at that age. Um, but then again you get the same pattern and uh, this is postnatal day 11 and uh, if you then go to postnatal day 10 that seems like it is about where the breaking point is because before then you simply don't have the connections yet and this is a lot of connections form at that age and then you immediately get the torus pattern which then suggests that the torus pattern actually this pattern comes before experience and then when you have this torus then you can apply it to make maps and that's a very smart brain for the uh, uh, smart way for the brain to solve navigation problems because it's already there just as was proposed by Immanuel Kant the philosopher of more than 200 uh, years ago that you actually are born with an internal map and you can't escape that map. It's just the way you perceive the world and uh, then you can apply it to the world which is much more efficient because imagine you're a mouse or a rat or you're a human being and someone is coming to catch you and wants to eat you. You can't first learn how to find your way. You have to be able to do it right from the beginning and in that sense having an innate map is very very useful. So that was Kant. And then finally, I'm approaching the end now, but I just say, that, is there any role for experience? And we investigated that by trying, by raising rats in three different environments. So this is uh, beginning from the right. This is a 
complex environment where rats could run around, climb ladders, move between uh, cages in different floors in the cage and, and so on. So they were having real fun. And then to the, in the middle you had a more standard environment, a square box where they lived uh, alone for a while. And in, to the left you have a circular, spherical environment. And both of the two left ones were not transparent so they didn't see much through and uh, all changing of bedding and so on was done in darkness with infrared goggles. And then if you let uh, rats uh, grow up in these spherical environments, then it actually at the first day of testing in the outside world, then they don't really have many nice grid cells. As you can see, it's really blurry pattern. Uh, whereas the ones that grow up in spherical environment, in uh, cubic environments, where they actually at least have walls, they are much better at uh, creating uh, grid-like patterns. And those that grow up in the complicated environment, they have many more of these cells. But this is just on the first day. They catch up almost after only a few days. And then even those that grow up in the sphere are able to, to have a nice grid pattern environments, which just means that they couldn't have done this from scratch. They are born with a map, even if they can't use it for the first two months of their lives. Once they get out of this spherical environment, they just use the map and calibrate the world. And then within a few days, they're just like uh, normal rats. All right. Um, now I think um, I'm reaching the end, right? I lost track of time. <laughs> uh, how long have you been speaking? Uh, almost an hour. All right. I, I try to close up. So I just wanted to say then that, uh, that um, I talked lots of el about electrical signals, but it is also possible to record signals from, from the, um, um, from using microscopes. So this is a new invention of microscopes. So Wei Jian Song, who has been in our lab for a while, constructed this microscope. It's only two and a half grams. It can be born, carried on the head of the animal or the mouse, and it can run around. And at the same time, because you use genetically expressed sensors in the cells, you can see the activity of uh, hundreds, many hundreds of cells in four planes of the brain while a rat is running around and catching chocolate pieces, just like uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the studies with electrical signals. So uh, another one, they can even do that when they climb the tower. So this mouse climbs a 20 centimeter high tower they do that no problem having this cable a microscope cable on the head no problem they eat their uh, biscuit which is on the top and then they even jump down at the same time as you can see the activity of the cells to the right and now watch this jumping no problem up again and doing the same again so this microscope can be carried and doesn't impede the behavior of the mouse in any way at all and uh, with that uh, you can uh, map the activity of cells in the entorhinal cortex and uh, I think just then to sum up here so I talked about uh, how we now actually know a lot about the internal spatial maps the internal maps of space that the brain has that have some GP -like, GPS like properties that they uh, can most usefully be studied at the population level where you then can see that this population code which has a shape or operates on a shape uh, that, uh, of a torus is actually prior to any spatial experience. And you may then wonder in my concluding slides here uh, that um, is this useful for anything? Of course it's useful to know how the brain works because this is basic research that paves the way for knowledge that we can use in many contexts, including treating all kinds of brain diseases. But in this case, there's an obvious link to Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease, to um, a very large extent, begins with cell deaths in the entorhinal cortex, the same area that contains these space coding uh, neurons. So you can see the transition here then from a normal a brain to the left, through, uh, and to the right you have Alzheimer's, so each black dot is a cell, and in the middle you have a condition we often call the mild cognitive impairment, which is a sort of a stage before Alzheimer. And to what you see to the right in color here is areas that change volume in the years before Alzheimer actually breaks out, and you can see that the volume change 
or the change in cell density already happens many many years before Alzheimer breaks out in, in overt symptoms which is while the bad news is that there is no cure for Alzheimer at the moment the good news is that it takes such a long time to evolve that once a cure becomes available you can actually stop it you have a big time window to stop it before it really becomes disruptive and uh, Alzheimer this just shows the number of people expected to get Alzheimer so in while it is around uh, 80 more than 80 million today and in the world it will be 152 in just uh, a couple of decades and uh, why well the, we live longer and uh, Alzheimer is uh, a disease that affects high ages and becomes very prevalent uh, beyond the age of, of 80 and uh, our life uh, expectancies increase in every country throughout uh, the world so that is the reason why this is becoming a serious problem but there are good hopes because uh, by understanding how the brain works and specifically how this part of the brain works there is hope that we'll be able to find the mechanisms that lead to this disease and this is just a slide to acknowledge all the people that have been involved in this work and uh, uh, I'm not mentioning particular names at the moment here, but uh, it is a lot of people and the lab is of course run together, much of the work, uh, the Nobel awarded work too, together with Maybert Moser and then have underlined uh, all the people who have uh, contributed to some of the major projects I, I presented. So, um, and of course, as you see at the bottom right, many people have uh, funded this work, which is of course essential for, for making any progress in the field. So with that, sorry for going a little bit over time, but I hope that with this I uh, have introduced you to a scientific field that is uh, very much under uh, development. So I just represent a big field that is really growing very, very fast. And uh, I think this growth in knowledge is also what's going to be reflected in uh, what you learn at school everywhere in the world and this is the education that again then I hope that will contribute to a more peaceful world in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Professor Moser for such an uh, inspiring talk. Uh, for I can speak for a non-neurologist in the room that are uh, my Gastro, gastroenterologist brain is now shrinking to the size of the rat's brain right now. But uh, uh, is, it, it has been indeed a very inspiring and exciting to, to learn about you know, the, the grid cells and you know, how our brain is functioning to time and space. Um, and even more so the implications of, you know, of uh, to treatment of uh, other neurological diseases. Uh, at this point, uh, do we have uh, any questions uh, from the audience? We are also being broadcasted live uh, on Facebook page of Chulalongkorn University. So if uh, anyone uh, watching at home uh, is having any questions at all, by all means you can uh, put the questions in the inbox, chat box of the Facebook live and, and we'll convey the questions to Professor Moser. Thank you. Please. Thank you very much for the very inspiring where, where, talk. Where are you? Just wave so I oh, see you. I'm over here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, good. Pum yeah. Jainaskun from Chulalongkorn School of Integrated Innovation. Um, it occurs to me that it's probably not by accident that the, the 2D grid cell is triangular because it's very got, it's got very dense packing kind of thing. Now, you did mention at some point that this, ex, this study has been verified in bats. And so I was wondering if you can elaborate on that because if you think about it, uh, bats operate in 3D space. Having said that, their food is actually most likely to be in 2D space. So maybe they don't have the, necessary, uh, the necessity to pack as much in the third dimension. Um, the, is there any evidence that it's, it's a lot less dense in the third dimension? And the reason I'm asking for it is because I think in terms of well, a lot of work that, that we do has to do with uh, navigation for drones and, and, and GPS. And we had the same problem. Uh, our drones operate in 3D space, but there, a lot of time the objective of our you know, flying 
is about focusing on the 2D underlying. So we don't have that much need for the third dimension. So maybe there's some kind of a granularity difference. Maybe it's even on a log scale because you know, the closer to the ground, it's a little bit more dense. So is there any kind of invariant study, as, I, as, yep. as it were, study in the third dimension of the grid cell? Yep. Thank uh, you. you. You raise an important question, and I agree with you that humans and many mammals um, operate in a kind of two and a half dimensional space so the third dimension is not so um, fully used as it is in some um, exceptional mammals and one of those exceptional mammals as you mentioned is the bat because that the bat is still a mammal so it has a brain that is very similar to uh, our own brain but uh, they operate in three-dimensional space because they fly and um, there has been work uh, trying to address exactly the question you raised that how are the grid fields distributed in three-dimensional space so is there some sort of optimal packaging and would you see clusters of fields that um, that follow uh, the rules for how I mean there are a couple of ways that you can that you pack very densely in three-dimensional space too those studies um, have been quite difficult to perform and they haven't concluded really that uh, there is a nice three-dimensional clustering of grid cells. So what they find is that there is an optimal distance uh, uh, between the clusters of activity in flying bats uh, so that, um, that um, if you take one cluster and measure the distance to neighboring clusters then it tends to be the same but if you, imagine, if you image all of the clusters in a big room where the uh, bat is flying, then you don't really see a nice grid, a three-dimensional grid pattern any longer. It sort of breaks down. The obvious question that then comes is, uh, is this because those clusters are distorted because um, the bat has a sort of three-dimensional map, that, but that the calibration uh, it's difficult because it's, it's, it's flying in open space and you, it's much harder to know how far away you are from the place where you started or where you're going to. Or is it that there really is some completely different rule um, for uh, grid cells in 3D? So I would think it is the former, but the only way to find out is actually if you can refer the grid cells not to physical space, but to themselves. So if you could do the population studies and do the work with the torus, uh, then you could actually find out. Because then you can ask, what is the pattern of activity in one cell compared to all the other cells? And not compare it with the walls or of the environment or whatever, but you just refer to all the other cells. And then you can see, just like we do in sleep, whether there is a grid pattern still. But to do this, you need hundreds of cells before you can extract the pattern, and they don't have that in those studies. So it's still an open question. It's a very relevant question whether we actually map two-dimensional flat space in a different way than three dimensions. It is an active research question that uh, will probably have the answer in a few years. Okay. Thank you for a great question. Uh, anyone else? Yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Sirwaj from KMUTC. Um, first of all, thank you for your uh, inspiring talk. Um, we learned a lot today. Um, my question is, um, are there causal contributions um, from you know, grid cell um, to the other cell types? Let's say like if you inhibit or excite the cells themselves, would it have the impact up on the neural representation of other cells like speed cells? Um, object or border cell, something like that. Thank you. So, so your question, make sure I understand your question. So if you excite the cells, a subset of the cells, will that affect their navigation properties? Yes, of other cell types. Yes. Yeah, of other cell types, sure. Um, yeah, that's um, also work that we are doing. It's uh, another interesting uh, topic because we now have the tools that we actually can excite selected cells in the system. So at the end of the talk, I showed 
the microscopy work, two photon microscopy work, where you, you can actually not only image the activity of the cells as they are active when a, a mouse is running around, but you can also use a laser to excite certain cells in this network and then see how does that affect the other cells, how does it affect the behavior of the animals. So, we, we are doing this because um, it is a nice way to test uh, theories about how the grid cells work together. Because one of the theories is that um, they work as a network where cells that are, have, uh, are active at uh, certain locations and those that are active at the same locations are strongly connected by excited connections and then the theory is that they inhibit the other cells and that makes that because of this uh, local excitation and widespread inhibition the result is that you get a bump of activity in the network and then the idea is that that bump moves around in accordance with your movement in space. Um, so it's a very uh, powerful way to test this if you then start uh, stimulating cells that should not be active but you make them active does this sort of uh, affect the natural bump of activity. So um, I don't have the results yet because this is ongoing work but uh, it's one of these possible parts that now are possible and uh, I think we can use this technique to stimulate cells and see what happens in the rest of the network to understand how the navigation system works collectively among many hundreds of cells. Thank you. Just for a little more question um, regarding calcium imaging, like um, the enterorhinal cortex is pretty deep down there. Um, I kind of wonder like how do, you, do, how do you image with the uh, confocal imaging? How do we image uh, yeah. the enterorhinal cortex? Yeah. Um, so enterorhinal cortex, uh, the blue area in in the brain here is quite difficult to imagine, image because it is actually between the cerebrum, the big part of the brain, and the cerebellum, which is on the back, and uh, it is uh, they sort of meet each other vertically, and in between there there is a, um, a sinus that contains a lot of blood. So how at all can you uh, you have you cannot affect that blood because if you leak that then uh, lots of blood will leak out and there's no way you can do any imaging. So you have to be very very careful and what you do is that you put a very small prism on the side of the brain and then you image from the top and if you squeeze that in you don't make any damage to the brain at all and you can still image from the surface even if the surface is vertical. So there is some uh, you need good, good manual skills, but uh, not me, but some people in the lab have these skills. So, uh, so it can be trained and uh, it is it's a little bit complicated, but uh, once uh, you, you learn the surgical uh, techniques, then uh, it works very, very well. Thank you so much. It's uh, very fascinating. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Gentleman in the back. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, Iran hospital, uh, ex, uh, other than the uh, endorhinal cortex, I have read the paper that there is other grid cells or grid cell-like property in the medial prefrontal cortex. Uh -huh. yeah, what is the true. difference between uh, the system in the medial prefrontal cortex mm. and the endorhinal cortex? Is yeah. this like one for the action and one for the information? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Seems like you, you are familiar with some of the human uh, literature because there are human studies that have uh, recorded grid-like activity in fMRI signals where they have reported that there is something similar in some areas of the medial prefrontal uh, cortex. Uh, that's the only indication of grid-like activity outside the medial enterorhinal cortex. Otherwise, and in direct recordings from cells in uh, rodents, it's always only, as far as we know at least, only in the enterorhinal, uh, in the medial part of the enterorhinal uh, cortex and uh, the neighboring uh, so-called parasubiculum. But it's a very close, uh, small area, actually a very small area because even inside the medial enterorhinal cortex, it's a cluster of uh, approximately only 1,000 cells approximately 
for each of these so-called modules or grid cells. So it's fairly small number of grid cells that are strongly interconnected, but uh, I'm not really aware that they exist outside. Whether they actually exist in prefrontal cortex, that's still to be determined because uh, we don't know if this is just some artifact of the imaging functional MRI technique or if it is really reflecting uh, hexagonal patterns of activity in individual cells. And uh, I think that can only be determined by direct recordings from the cells. And then if those are different, of course, uh, that will be very, very important questions to resolve. But so far, I think the data only suggests they exist in the medial entorhinal cortex. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. um, I have one quick question. Um, first of all, I think it's a very pleasure to hear you talk today. Me and my friends, as a medical students, we feel that um, when we first heard of the topics that you talk, we thought that navigation is one of the very basic functions of humans, so we didn't think much about it. But after hearing you talk, it's things that it requires such an intricate system. Um, our question is that, um, as I are navigating throughout the daily life, I think it's very correlated to our like, visual sensories, but the grid cell actually required external cue to form this kind of signal. Mm -hmm. And what kind of signal cue does it need? And what would happen if we observe the grid cell in maybe the blind patients or blind rat or blind mouse? Okay. So uh, external cues, I think uh, based on the studies we uh, did in uh, sleeping rats and in very, very young rats, I don't think they are necessary to form the grid pattern but they are necessary to um, anchor the grid pattern to a certain place. Uh, and for that you can use all kinds of sensory cues. You can use vision is of course very important, but it's not necessary because uh, um, a rat can have a nice grid pattern even in complete darkness, and as you saw also when they're sleeping. But in darkness, it's not so stable because if you have been a long time in a completely dark room, then uh, you lose track of where you, you may lose track of where you are, and then the grid pattern will start drifting around a little bit. But you can still use other cues. So for example, if you're a rat, you're walking around in a box, will bump into the walls occasionally, and can you use that as a reference for where you are instead? And then there are also other auditory cues. You can hear things around and smell, and uh, all of those can be used. But um, when you then ask about blind rats, uh, I don't know that because uh, we haven't tested that, but my guess would be that it's very much the same as in darkness, that you can just use other cues instead, uh, and that would compensate for the lack of uh, vision. I'm sorry, too many hands are showing, but uh, I will get just one last question, and I, I, this probably has to go to Dr. Shai Pat, who is the lead uh, researcher in our neuroscience unit. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk, as always. <laughs> I have one last question for you regardless, uh, regarding that your role as, you know, you, you are, got your uh, degree as psychologist, and then you moved to do neuroscience, and then got a award in medicine. Um, how is, and I would, I would like to ask, like, when did you realize that you know, you're, you're getting close to the, no, the Nobel Prize? And um, have you ever doubted that this would happen to you? Or can yeah. you tell us a little bit about your, your journey as a scientist? Because yeah, I, in, in this room, it will be full <laughs> yeah. of people who like, you know, maybe have their doubts. Yeah. No, no, in it's area. an interesting uh, question. I often get uh, asked, uh, did you plan to get the Nobel Prize? And the answer is no. <laughs> There's not something, uh, I mean, I, I think one of the, one of the first um, requirements if you want to be a successful scientist is that forget about all the prizes, just be interested in science and do the best science. And if you do good science, you, do, you mo have a high motivation, you will discover things and, uh, and then, uh, then things go by themselves. So uh, in my case, uh, I knew that the discovery of the grid cells was important. Uh, um, that was pretty clear from the beginning because it was a stunning discovery and very much different from anything that people um, uh, had suggested. And also it was possible already then to see 
how it might be important for, uh, for mapping our position in space and for navigation. Um, but, I mean, when did I start sensing that they were interested in uh, the Nobel Committee? That was probably when they started to invite us to uh, trips to Stockholm, because although they never say it, they, they ask you to come and give lectures, and they do it over and over again, together with other candidates in medicine, physiology, and you sense the context, although no one really says it. So, uh, um, but that then happened over a period, uh, in, in our case, only over a period of uh, uh, eight years, which is fairly short, because usually in uh, medicine, it may take 30 years before you get the prize because the committee has to be convinced that it actually makes a difference. So we were lucky in that sense. Yeah. Well, I really yeah. wish we had more time, but all, as all good parties must come to an end. Um, and uh, today we had a very uh, fruitful discussion. And you know, personally, uh, for non-neurologists, I'm even more excited of the prospect of you know this. Uh, groundbreaking discovery by Professor Moser is going to lead to uh, cure of many uh, neurologic diseases, and um, as you can, as we all can witness today, that you know, the impact of uh, of his discovery uh, goes really beyond the field of neuroscience. You know, it's, uh, in a global impact, we are honored today to have been joined by the ambassador uh, of uh, Norway, Malaysia, Czech Republic, Qatar. Timor Leste to Thailand, also the media with Radio Thailand. So thank you very much for your interest and your presence here is an honor to us all. For as a closing remark, uh, I would like to kindly invite, as I say, Professor Chan Chai Sidipan, the Dean of Faculty of Medicine, Jalalangon University, to deliver a closing remarks as appreciation to, 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 to Professor Moses' presence today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Professor Chan Chai, could you please give us the honor? <laughs> So Your Excellency, the Ambassador to Thailand, Professor Morser, the Nobel Laureate for Medicine in 2014, Mr. Uwe, uh, Chairman of International Peace Foundation, and distinguished guests. It is, has been a great honor for us, Chukalongkorn University, to host this state-of-the-art um, lecture by Professor Morser as a part of a Japan Asian Bridges event series jointly organized by Chukalongkorn University and the Institute of Peace Foundation. I believe I can speak for everyone in this room and online that Professor Moser's elaboration of his journey toward the discovery of the grid cell was indeed inspiring to all of us. His connecting dot is an, a testament of how hard work and a good team can achieve something extraordinary. The expansion of his ongoing research not only contribute tremendously to the field of neuroscience, but also its clinical implication to the potential benefits of other diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease, which speaks volume to the gravity of this groundbreaking discovery, especially in our aging society, not only for Thailand, but also an impact to the global scale. On behalf of the Faculty of Medicine, John Hong Kong University, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to our esteemed keynote speaker, Professor Edward Inkald Moser, and the Notable High Graduate for Medicine for visiting us here, teaching us and inspiring us today. I would also like to convey special thanks to Mr. Uwe Molovest, um, the Chairman of the International Peace Foundation and Joran Kong University International Affairs Team, who have successfully organized this event. Lastly, I would like to thank our sponsor, EMW Thailand, the Sitani Hotels and Resorts, Kasikon Bank, and Mitsui Foodoons Limited, who have made this exciting educational event possible. With this, thank you very much. And, um on behalf of uh, Chulalongkorn University, uh, may I kindly invite Professor Chan Chai to give the token of, of appreciation uh, from Chulalongkorn University to Professor Moser.